All right. Well, good morning. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with uh, part three of our heat illness series. This will conclude the heat illness series. I'm Jim Brewer for Rooftop Safety USA. Thank you for attending. Um, in part one, we define the different types of heat illness and discuss treatments for that. In part two, we looked at ways you can prevent heat illness. And today, in part three, we're going to discuss the heat plan and actually planning and being proactive to prevent heat illness. And if you missed part one or two, they're available on the Rooftop Safety USA uh, YouTube channel. So you can go back and watch <clears throat> those anytime. You can use them for company meetings. Uh, they're great for things like that. All right. So planning. That involves training your workers before the heat sets in gathering supplies before the heat sets in. Make sure you have plenty of available water, uh, coolers to put the water in, uh, shade devices. Uh, they're great if you're gonna be mixing some mortar or something, uh, have a shade tent up over that. It keeps your mortar from drying out so quickly and it gives your workers a place to take a break out of the sunlight. And then monitor the weather. Know what the weather's gonna be doing, plan for it, and implement your heat plan whenever the heat index will be above 80 degrees. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So the heat index is a combination of air temperature and relative hum humidity. And they combine to increase the apparent temperature or the apparent heat that your body experiences and your body responds differently based on that heat index. So you can see down around 80 degrees, um, that's a caution level, then extreme caution as the temperature and or humidity go up then you get into the danger level, and then eventually you get into extreme danger. And we talked about those a lot in part two. So this shows um, an outline less than 91 degrees or 90 and less. Basic heat safety and planning is necessary. From 91 to 103 degrees, is your moderate risk level. Uh, you need to heighten awareness of your, of your work teams so they can be planning for it. Above 103, uh, you really need to start being careful. And above 115, uh, you need aggressive measures to protect your workers. And, you know, that's the point you, you know, may need to consider even rescheduling certain activities. So how do we know what the actual heat index is? I'm going to switch screens here for a minute and show you a great app uh, that's available for free. It was produced by NIOSH, which is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. So I'm going to switch screens and demo that here for a second. Okay, so this is what the heat app looks like. It, you know, it uses current data to show you uh, what the risk levels are. You can see currently uh, it's only 55 degrees where I'm at. So, of course, minimal risk for heat illness under those conditions. Um, so then you can go to the next tab over, the hourly tab. And um, again, it shows you the same thing, but you can scroll through and it's using the weather forecast to predict the risk each hour throughout the day. Okay, so that's kind of cool. You know, during your morning meeting, you can be planning ahead to see what the day is like. 
And then there's another tab that gives symptoms of heat, uh, heat illness here. Uh, you can see from heat rash, heat cramps, uh, rhabdomyolysis, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. Then yet on another tab, they give you first aid for it, uh, what to do. And then on the more tab, finally, a few more resources. Um, so I think that's a great app. Um, you know, certainly your crew leaders and, you know, your supervisors ought to have that on their phones. Uh, it's a free download. It's available for, you know, Android and, um, and iPhone. So go to your uh, app store and Google NIOSH heat app and you'll find that and find it very useful. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch back. Okay, so that was a little bit about the NIOSH heat app. Check it out. Okay, so no, here's a note that's appropriate for all heat exposure levels. Keep in mind that heavy protective clothing or PPE may increase the, uh, the apparent heat index for your people. Um, if you're working in direct sunlight, no shade available, that can increase the heat index. Working on uh, roofs that are ref reflecting a lot of heat up to you, that's a problem. Um, and then if you're in uh, any type of confined space, like an attic or a chase, uh, additional problems there. You don't have much circulation. The heat builds up in those areas. Uh, attics, as you know, can get extremely hot. You know, if you're doing a, a chimney installation and you got to spend a couple hours reframing in the attic, uh, you need to be very careful. You need to make sure somebody's monitoring the people in the attic to make sure they're staying safe. Okay, another note, um, and I, I think OSHA takes an extreme definition here about having medical services readily available, but they have, have defined a couple of times that they want medical services available to workers within three to four minutes, okay? So unless you're doing a job at the local hospital, um, that's not real likely. You can't call 911 and have them there in three or four minutes, you know? Somebody's got to make the phone call, the dispatcher has to gather all the information, then the dispatcher has to dispatch the call, uh, then the call has to be received by the fire or EMS services, they've got to figure out where they're going, walk out to their trucks, get in the truck, and then drive to the incident. That doesn't happen in three or four minutes under the best of circumstances. So the bottom line is somebody on your work crew ought to have first aid training. Um, you know, that's a, that's a great, um, you know, safety meeting, safety day that you can do. Uh, contact your local Red Cross office or just Google first aid training in your area. Um, there's a, also a couple of courses that CSIA has uh, pre-approved for uh, continuing education credits. Uh, so, you know, good way to get more CEUs at home. Okay. So we'll talk about the risk level below 91 degrees. You need to make sure your crews have adequate drinking water, encourage workers to wear sunscreen, and let your workers accl acclimatize, acclimate to the heat. Uh, those first few weeks of the summer, uh, heat stress plays a load on people. They're not used to it. Uh, they need time to gradually increase their duration and intensity of work. 
moderate risk levels from 91 to 103 degrees. Crew leaders need to remind workers to drink water often. Review your heat illness training with workers so they're alert to the signs and symptoms of heat illness, can take appropriate measures before it becomes a problem. Start scheduling breaks in a cool shaded area so your workers can get out of the heat. Uh, set up a buddy plan so that your work teams are watching out for each other and alert for signs of heat illness developing in any of your team. High risk uh, is from 103 to 115 degrees. Alert your workers of these high risk conditions. Actively encourage workers to hydrate. You know, if you're managing a, a team or a crew, make sure your people are taking breaks. Get them down off the roof or off the scaffolding. And hey, Joe, man, I want you to get in the shade. I want you to hydrate you know, rest, catch your breath, okay? Um, watch the level of physical activity, establish and enforce work and rest cycles, uh, use active cooling techniques, which active cooling are things like uh, cool moist towels around your neck, uh, mist fans, ice packs, any of those things that help you deal with the heat. Uh, adjust the work activity in the pace and just realize when you get into high or extreme risk levels, you're just not going to be as productive as you could be. Okay. Reschedule strenuous activity if possible. And, you know, keep in mind that your effective work, uh, you know, is maybe 50, 60 percent, certainly not more than 75 percent. So, you know, you're resting at least a quarter of the time to a third of the time. If it's really bad, maybe half the time. Uh, so the work pace you're, is just going to be slower. You got to watch out for it. And then when we get to extreme risk levels, that's heat indexes above 115 degrees, you need to establish and enforce hydration and rest schedules, reschedule non-essential activity, move work to the coolest part of the day, maybe adjust your work areas. Um, I know sometimes we've had work crews showing up as early as five o'clock in the morning you know, so they can work from, you know, five till noon or something uh, before you get into that stifling afternoon heat. Um, you know, alert workers of the extreme danger, make sure they're aware of it, start conducting proactive monitoring, enforcing rest breaks, checking people's pulse and temperature during those breaks. Um, anytime pulse or pulse or temperature is above 100. That's a signal that uh, additional rest, hydration is necessary. Make sure you've got somebody competent to recognize heat illness problems and probably render first aid should be available on site. Uh, stop work as necessary. And again, realize your effective work to rest is at best 50%, but probably less. Drinking water, remember you need to have at least two gallons per day per technician on site, ideal temperature for water, 50 to 60 degrees. So it needs to be, you know, ice down, cool, um, consider hydration packs, you know, water packs that you can wear on your uh, back, uh, something like that. So guys have plenty of, uh, of cool drinking water. Increase your rest and water breaks uh, as temperature or humidity rises, when the sun gets stronger, when there's no air movement, when they're using 
heavy protective clothing or PPE and as activity levels increase, all of those can increase the apparent stress and heat level for people and you need to watch out for it. You need to have a plan for responding to emergencies um, and you need to make sure the workers on site know what that plan is. If somebody starts experiencing signs and symptoms of heat illness, what do they do? Who do they call? Who do they reach out to? Is it your crew leader or team leader? Do you call 911? Uh, make sure people know their location. You know, if you need to call 911 but you don't know where you're at, that's problematic. Um, and if you're in a big work site, have somebody available uh, to watch for the arrival of EMS services and guide them to the person that needs help. Uh, some of you know I'm also a paramedic, and you know, some if you show up at a big work site, you know, some big building being built or something like that, and uh, and you just show up you know, you, you can lose precious time trying to find the individual that needs help. So make sure people are aware. Okay, give aid as appropriate. I mean, first thing to do if somebody's experiencing heat illness problems, get them out of the heat, get them into a cool shaded area, you know, get them into an air conditioned area if possible loosen restrictive clothing, uh, you know, start fanning the skin, misting water is good, placing ice packs in the armpits, groin, and neck. Uh, if the person is able, have them drink cool water, uh, but don't force it on them if they're unresponsive or just not uh, acting right and certainly uh, monitor the worker and call, e call EMS uh, if it seems serious. Um, so what's out there? Um, currently, federal OSHA does not have a heat standard. Uh, I know California OSHA does, maybe some other states do. But keep in mind that employers are still required to protect employees from known or predictable hazards. That's found in the general duty clause that simply says employers have to provide a safe work environment. And heat illness is predictable. If it's hot outside and you're not being proactive to prevent heat illness, it's logical that somebody's gonna have a problem. So uh, there's no leap of faith needed to, to know you need to provide uh, precautions for your team, okay? Mm -hmm. So hopefully this course will help you uh, stay safe. If you haven't seen you know, part one and part two, go back and review them. They're available on our YouTube channel. And What's on the horizon? You know, certainly I've heard rumors that OSHA is working on a heat standard. Um, if they develop one, they will likely mandate break based on the heat index. Um, they may introduce uh, wet bulb globe temperature requirements. Um, this is, you would actually have to have a physical monitoring device that measures temperature and humidity and gives you an accurate prediction right on your work site of what the heat index is. Uh, this is a device that costs a couple of hundred bucks, might be required if OSHA uh, actually introduces a, uh, a heat index uh, requirement. Frankly, I'm surprised they haven't done it already. So here's some additional resources. The NIOSH Guide to Occupational Exposure to Heat and Hot Environments 
is available as a pr free publication. It's 192 pages long. Uh, so if you're in, you know, really want to study this topic more, uh, that's an excellent resource. So that brings us to the end of our three-part series on heat illness. I hope you found it useful uh, and hopefully it will help you keep your team safe. Summer's coming up and, uh, and let's all be safe out there. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the screen share now and see if there's any questions. Yeah, Jim, I got a couple for you. You ready? Okay. Number one, what do you feel the effect is to the individual from wearing a cloth mask? And I'm telling what reason I'm seeing this, I'm, you know, I'm wondering, are you breathing the same air again and possibly could develop ill effects because it traps the air that you're exhaling inside the mask and goes right back in. And I'm starting to have some thoughts about this. What's your thoughts? Well, so it does, it does increase your temperature a little bit. You're not able to exhale and rid um, heat. Um, I actually went to a doctor last week. I had a doctor's appointment and I'd been wearing a mask for a while. And then they took my temperature and my temperature was, was higher than normal. I think it was just from wearing the mask. Uh, because I'd checked my temperature earlier that morning and then I checked it later in the afternoon, same day, and it was back to normal readings. Um, and, and we mentioned that in the seminar, any protective gear that you're wearing is, uh, is going to increase the heat effects that you feel on your body. So, but what about the actual oxygen? Do you think we could, people that are using masks could be rebreathing the same air coming back in because it's not able to get through the mask going out clearly. Oh, uh, there may be some effect there um, where you're not able to exhale. You may be trapping some of the carbon dioxide that you would normally off gas when you exhale. Yeah. Uh, certainly something to think about kind of like yeah. um, I know we really don't do it much anymore but in the early days of EMS if somebody was hyperventilating we'd have them breathe into a paper bag uh, because they would start eventually rebreathing some of the carbon dioxide which would slow down their respiratory response uh, possibly a similar effect because when you're wearing a mask you know, you're trapping both your your nose and your mouth. So that could be could be a factor. Yeah. What about an extremely in really cold weather? How bad do you feel that excessive clothing could cause heat exhaustion even in very cold? Um in a in a cold environment, I don't I don't think so. It's it's not likely that you're going to have a need for protective clothing greater than the need for clothing for warmth. So in a cold environment, I don't, I don't think additional PPE is going to be a, be an issue. No, I'm it's just talking about, I'm just clothing. talking about the amount of clothes that you may put on to stay warm. Could this possibly be something that cause heat exhaustion in cold weather? Uh, I don't think so because okay. you know, if, if you feel like you're overheating, you're going to take some clothing off. So yeah. I don't think so. Okay. I've never heard of, you know, I've studied, you know, not studied, but I've read a lot about expeditions to Everest and stuff and they're wearing, they're wearing plenty of clothing. I've never heard anybody have heat illness problems as yeah. a result of that. Yeah. I'm just thinking back to when we used to ski a lot and be, you know, dressed and then you get exerted coming down. Like, God, I'm burning up in these clothes and all this kind of stuff. And you unzip like, your jacket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe take your beanie off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, 
Gotcha. I think I think I think you will naturally adjust to that to prevent overheating in a cold climate. The yeah. problem is is when it's so hot outside and there's nothing you can do. Yeah. You know, as as a review, when you're when the ambient temperature is above body temperature, it's hard for your body to rid uh, or expel the additional heat. Mm -hmm. uh, in a cold climate, you don't have that problem. Yeah. All right. Uh, good questions. Anybody else out there have any questions? Feel free to chime in. Otherwise, uh, I think we'll call it a wrap on our uh, three-part heat illness um, series. Uh, next week, May 12th, we're going to talk about solar distortion and why chimney guys need to be aware of it. Uh, we have a special guest uh, lecturer, Dave Johnston. Uh, for any old timers in the industry, he's well known, uh, but he's probably the country's leading authority on solar distortion. So uh, looking forward to next week's presentation. It ought to be a lot of fun. And uh, until then, stay safe out there, guys. Uh, give me a call if I can ever help you out and have a great week. Thanks for watching.